The eeriest part about any urban legend is that belief that it is based on some form of truth. And when it comes to tales shared around the campfire, the urban legend of Dudley Town in Connecticut apparently has it all. Black shadows, disembodied voices, floating orbs of light, a bizarre lack of vegetation in the forest, unexplainable figures seen in the shadows, not to mention the mysterious group referred to as the Dark Forest Association, known to police the area with militant force. It all adds up to one question. What is really going on in Dudley Town? And that's where we come in. Tonight we will explore the stories and reports and see if we can separate truth from urban legend. In the far reaches of northwestern Connecticut, in the shadows of the mountains, and lost in the pages of time, rest the remains of the small village of Dudley Town. And while the homes of this once thriving community are long since abandoned, many people believe the land where this town once stood is far from empty. Laying in wait amidst the forests surrounding the town are tales of ghosts, demons, unexplained mysteries, curses, and a rich history that dates back to the very origins of America. In the early 1740s, a man by the name of Thomas Griffiths would settle in the area and purchase the first plot of land in what would become Dudley Town. There are no records to say that he ever took up residence in Dudley Town, but he did own half the land in that area in 1741. A few years later, in 1747, the village would find its name with the arrival of Gideon Dudley, who would be followed to the region shortly after by his two brothers. It would be the Dudley brothers that many would point to as having brought a curse to the small town, a curse that has reportedly been plaguing the area ever since. According to the rumors, the so-called curse had its beginnings in England in 1510. At that time, Edmund Dudley was beheaded for his involvement in a plot to overthrow King Henry VIII. It is believed that because of his part in the plot, a curse was placed on his family. A curse that would plague all Dudley descendants as they would find horror and death following them. The legitimacy of this curse would gain traction when in the years following Edmund's beheading, the surviving Dudleys would experience a disquieting run of very bad luck. Edmund's son, John Dudley, would also attempt to gain control of the British throne. His plan was to arrange a marriage between his son, Guilford, and Lady Jane Grey, who was next in succession for the throne. After Edward VI died, the plan would prove, albeit temporarily, successful, and Lady Jane would take the throne. However, the plan was ultimately discovered, resulting in the execution of Lady Jane as well as two of the Dudleys. To make matters worse for the Dudleys, Guilford's brother would return from his time as a military officer in France, bringing with him a plague that had been spread throughout the officers and troops. The sickness wiped out British soldiers in massive numbers and would eventually continue to spread throughout the country, resulting in the deaths of thousands. It would be John Dudley's third son, Robert, whose actions would lead the Dudleys to the small section of Connecticut. As the Earl of Leicester, and a favorite of Elizabeth I, John would wisely decide to leave England and travel to the New World. It would be his, somewhat, 
Lockyer descendant William, who had settled in Guilford, Connecticut. It would be Abiel, Barzillay, and Gideon, William's descendants, who would later buy a plot of land from Mr. Thomas Griffiths to start a small farm. And from there, the brothers would continue to buy up land. The land today looks much as it did when Griffiths first arrived. It is covered in thick forest, and the ground is strewn with rocks. The nearby mountains shadow the area, resulting in very little sunlight, leading to its later being named the rather ominous Dark Entry Forest. Only the cellar holes and a few stone formations remain, and the roads that once paved the way to this area are now little more than narrow trails, where only a few adventurous hikers and the occasional ghost hunter dare to wander. And although it is forbidden, those curious and brave enough will still dare to venture through and into the shadowy woods surrounding this potentially literal ghost town. However, to all accounts, Dudley Town was never an actual town. This section of Cornwall Township was ruled out as a good area for farming, with the large amounts of rock strewn about, and the near constant darkness of the area thanks to its surrounding mountains. But when iron ore was discovered nearby, people would begin to matriculate to the area. Dudley Town never had any stores, schools, or churches. Those who settled in the area had to obtain their provisions from neighboring towns. The population of Dudley Town was never large. At its peak, according to an 1854 map of the area, there was a mere 26 families living there. In spite of all of these things, the town did thrive for a time. Dudley Town would be noted for its timber, which was burned and used to make coal for the nearby Litchfield County iron furnaces there in Cornwall, as well as several surrounding towns. Despite the outward signs of prosperity, however, there were strange deaths and bizarre occurrences at Dudley Town from the start. Historians have attempted to downplay and even debunk these occurrences. After all, so few people lived there, could the information be reliable? Disappearances, cases of insanity, illogical deaths. Dudley Town was rife with sad stories, but... Were they out of the ordinary in a time where there was not an abundance of medical professionals who could attend to those sick of both body and mind? In a town that wasn't really a town at all, with the constant need to leave the area for supplies, were people disappearing or just leaving and opting not to return of their own free will? But others have argued that this is exactly the reason that Dudley Town was so small and close-knit, that these cases were, in fact, odd. The number of deaths that have occurred here would not be such a high number in large towns. But in this small community, one can't help but wonder what exactly was taking place. It's no wonder, regardless of whether or not it is true, that whispers would soon be heard around Dudley Town that maybe the land and thus its residents, were cursed. From Abiel Dudley going slowly insane, becoming a ward of the town, and losing the entirety of his fortune, Abiel's good friend and neighbor Gershon Hollister being killed while building a barn for fellow neighbor William Tanner, who would desperately complain to villagers of strange creatures coming out of the woods at night, it seemed that anyone who came in touch with the Dudleys would find themselves suffering from strange and unusual occurrences. The question would be raised as to if it were the Dudleys that were cursed, or if the very grounds of Dudley Town itself were to blame. Nathaniel Carter would move his family to Dudley Town in 1759, moving into the house once owned by Abiel Dudley before he was made a ward of the town. After a mysterious plague swept through Dudley Town and Cornwall, taking the lives of relatives of Nathaniel, he would pack his family up and moved them to being happed in New York in 1763. However, those who believe in the curse of Dudley Town claim that the curse had already set its sights on the Carter clan. During an attack by natives in the wilderness area that the family had settled in, 
Nathaniel, along with his wife and infant child, would be slaughtered. The Carters' other three children would be abducted and taken to Canada where the two daughters would be ransomed. In yet another bizarre occurrence, General Herman Swift, who had served under future President George Washington in the Revolutionary War, would be struck by lightning alongside his wife in 1804 while the pair stood on their front porch. His wife, Sarah Fay, was tragically killed instantly, and General Swift would go insane, dying shortly thereafter. After the Civil War, Dudley Town began to die, and many of the villagers packed up and moved away. The demise of the town itself is not all that surprising, whether or not you believe in the so-called curse. Its location was, well, foolhardy at best. Surrounded by hills and at elevations of more than 1,500 feet, there was little chance that a good crop would ever grow to sustain life in the small village. The winters were exceptionally harsh, and even though there were hardy apple trees around the area, their growth would be stunted from the months of cold. And as already mentioned, the soil was rocky at best, and the area plagued by almost too much water pooling into the tepid swamps and seeping into the earth. But even if you overlook the idea of an actual curse and admit that the location of the town must have had a hand in its undoing, the sheer number of unusual deaths and mental conditions in such an isolated area more than suggests that something was definitely out of the ordinary. And no matter how hard the skeptical tried to debunk and discredit the next mysterious event to occur in Dudley Town, their efforts always seemed to fall short. This event occurred in 1901, at a time when the population of Dudley Town had dwindled away to almost nothing. One of the last residents of the town was a man named John Patrick Brophy. Tragedy visited swiftly, and in several blows. First, his wife would die of consumption, which was not all that uncommon in those days, and there wasn't really anything strange about her ailment, and she had suffered from it for years. This did not, however, lessen Brophy's grief. But he was soon further stricken when his two children vanished into the forest just a short time after his wife's funeral. And while their disappearances could very well have been considered voluntary, if we look at the fact that they had been accused of stealing sleigh blankets, and although this is a minor offense for children, probably the scary prospect of the potentials of prosecution for that may have led to them wanting to run away, although there is nothing to indicate this. They just vanished and were never found. Shortly after, the Brophy's house burned to the ground in an unexplained fire, and not long after that, Brophy himself vanished into the forest, never to be seen again. In the early 1900s, Dudley Town was completely deserted. The remaining homes began to fall into disrepair and ruin, and soon, the force began to reclaim the village that had been carved out. But there was still one other death that proponents of the curse have connected to Dudley Town. And while a curse may be unlikely, and urban legend, it does mark one additional case of insanity for an isolated region that was already riddled with several mental health cases. Around 1900, Dr. William Clark came to Cornwall and fell in love with the forest and the quiet country life. Clark had been born in 1877 and had grown up on a farm in New Jersey. He later became a professor of surgery and taught at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons, as well as earning a reputation as the leading cancer specialist in New York. He would purchase 1,000 acres of land in the wilds of Connecticut, which included Dudley Town and began construction of a summer and vacation home here. Over the next number of years, he and his wife Harriet Bank Clark visited the home on weekends and during the summer until it was completed. After that, it became mostly a holiday house for short visits in the summer and for Thanksgiving. Together, they maintained an idyllic second life near Dudley Town. Until 1918. One summer weekend, Dr. Clark was called away to New York on an emergency his wife stayed behind, and according to the story, he returned 36 hours later to find that she had gone insane, just as a number of previous residents of the village had done. 
The story also claims that she told of strange creatures that came out of the forest and attacked her, hearkening back to the story of William Tanner. She would sadly commit suicide soon after. But how much truth is there to this tale? Perhaps more than some would like you to believe. It has been recorded that for several years before her suicide, Mrs. Clark suffered from a chronic illness. There is nothing to indicate what this ailment might have been or whether it was a physical or a mental illness. Although some may argue that mentally stable individuals don't ordinarily take their own lives. As far as whether or not she saw strange creatures in the woods, well, we will never really know for sure. But even if we do disregard this, we still have one more suicide that occurred to a resident of the nearly non-existent village of Dudley Town. Well, undoubtedly shattered by his wife's suicide, Dr. Clark continued to maintain his house in Dudley Town and continued to visit. A number of years later, he remarried and returned to stay at his summer house until a larger home was completed nearby in 1930. In 1924, he and his second wife, Corita, as well as other doctors, friends, and interested landowners, formed the Dark Entry Forest Association. It was designed to act as a forest preserve so that the land around Dudley Town would remain forever wild. Dr. Clark died in Cornwall Bridge in February 1943, and Corita passed away five years later. A number of their children and family members still reside in the area. In 1926, the Dark Forest Entry Association would take ownership of the acreage known as Dudley Town and would immediately list it as private property. Present-day Dudley Town has managed to maintain the mystic intrigue of thrill-seekers, urban explorers, and, yes, ghost hunters. However, entry to Dudley Town is now strictly forbidden. The area is covered in no trespassing signs and is patrolled by local police attempting to keep the public out. But if the area is abandoned, why the almost overkill in preventing entry? Sure, the area is overgrown, but clearly it is also still traversable as hikers were allowed in Dudley Town as early as 1999. So why all the mystery? Maybe there is more credence to the curse than the Connecticut Historical Society would have you believe. And while locals will also tell you there is nothing supernatural about the area, there have been several reports over the years that paint a very different picture. Famed paranormal investigative duo Ed and Lorraine Warren would be granted access to the ghost town in the 1970s, and it would not take long for the pair to come to the conclusion that the area was suffering from demonic possession, leading more to believe that the land could very well be cursed. And with this land being lost to time and the elements, the environment alone could be considered discomforting, but travelers to the area have made claims of many odd, eerie, and downright terrifying occurrences. Many would report to pockets of cold air in certain areas and a sensation of being watched and that something ominous was looming around them. Many people have also reported capturing shadowy figures out of the corner of their eyes and mist-like shapes appearing in photographs. One anonymous hiker reported feeling a phantom hand slapping them and pushing them back. Many believe Dudley Town to be the most haunted and most evil place in Connecticut. Its history absolutely gives credibility to those thoughts, with the many disappearances, cases of insanity, death. It's hard not to believe that something cursed was going on in that village. And while we may never have a definitive answer as to whether or not Dudley Town is truly cursed, one thing is certain. Something is clearly odd about this little town in Connecticut. And people will continue to speculate on what is real, what is imagined, and the rest is urban legend. Thank you all so much for watching. What do you guys think? Is Dudley Town cursed? Share your thoughts in the comments below. I would love to hear what you guys think about this one. 
And if you have any other locations or urban legends that you've heard of that you want me to cover, comment those for me as well. Also, please subscribe to the channel. We are inching our way ever closer to 500 subscribers, and I'd love to have you as a part of the Press Start family. Until next time, stay out of trouble. And we won't blame you if you sleep with the lights on. Good night.